Hey, Sadie Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Thanks so much for being here. Coming up on the show today, uh, next segment, I'm going to talk about why I'm leaving big tech and what we're doing instead, mikeslater.locals.com. Uh, then we're going to do, of course, our tribute to Martin Luther King Jr. and how what he did is completely different than the civil rights movement that's going on today. And then, of course, it's Monday, so we'll wrap up the show with Professor Vincent Rack and Yellow and get the latest on, on strains and mutations and the vaccines and all the rest. All right. Uh, what really happened in the Capitol? This is tricky because the answer is whatever you want. <laughs> what happened at the Capitol is whatever you want it to be. I have three examples I want to share here of what happened at the Capitol is whatever you want. It's confirmation bias at work. Confirmation bias is where you favor only new information that confirms your beliefs that you already have, and you reject anything that challenges those beliefs. So you have your opinion about what happened, and then you only accept video and stories or whatever that confirm what you think, and you reject anything that challenges it. Right? This confirmation bias makes it very difficult to have any sort of productive conversation about anything ever because we can't even agree on what happened. So I got three examples of that. Something just as basic as did the rioters break in to the Capitol? You've seen this video here of uh, what looks like police officers opening the door and people like, look at that, they're like orderly walking in, like very calmly. <laughs> it's like, like, I bet if you took a video of a, a, a tourists on a regular Saturday morning waiting for the tour to begin, and the Capitol, they open up the doors and people are like scurrying in, like that's like, that's like, as so like, are they violently breaking in? Well, but then of course you've also seen videos like this of people aggressively breaking in. So what narrative do you want to grab onto? Well, it depends what you already think or what you want to think happened. And what happened on Wednesday has something for everyone. I'll give you another example. This is a, uh, yeah, that's very different than the first video we saw. All right, here's uh, an AP headline. This is in newspapers all across the country. Capital mob aimed to, quote, assassin, capture and assassinate elected officials. Holy cow, capture and assassinate? That's a, I've never heard that one before. That's a broad brush. First of all, it's the mob aimed. It wasn't one person. The headline didn't say, here's John Smith who aimed to. It's just the mob. The entirety of it. The mob aimed, meaning that was their intent, was to capture and assassinate. Good night, was it? Almost every video I've seen were people inside just meandering about, wandering. I'm not sure what to do once they got inside. This is an amazing video. It just came out yesterday. This is the weirdo shaman guy that we've all seen with the horns and everything. This is him walking into the Senate chamber. Check this out. Hey! Man, glad to see you guys. You guys are patriots. Look at this guy. He's got covered in blood. God bless you. Yes. You good, sir? You need medical attention? I'm good. Thank you. You all right? I got shot in the face. Where are they? I got shot in the face with some kind of plastic bullet. Any chance I could get you guys yeah. to leave the Senate wing? We will. I, I've been making sure they ain't disrespecting the place. Okay, just want to let you guys know this is like the <coughs> sacredest place. I know. I know. Hey. What? What? What a surreal video is that? I guess you can. It's what that video is whatever you want it to be too. But to me, that doesn't look like people with much of a plan or an intent to do anything. Now, it turns out that that AP story with that headline is about that guy with the horns. He's the one, they say, wanted to capture and assassinate. Okay, so what's their evidence? So you read the article. Prosecutors say that after Chansley, the horned guy, climbed up to the dais where Vice President Mike Pence had been presiding moments earlier, which you just saw, Chansley wrote a threatening note to Pence. What did the threatening note say? It said... I'm going to capture and assassinate you. No. It said it's only a matter of time justice is coming. I mean, that's like, that's like weird and creepy or whatever, but like from that, you get 
aimed to capture and assassinate? Seems like a stretch. But if that fits the narrative you want, right? If, if you want to make this a terrorist attack and all the rest, then y'all, that's all the evidence you need. Justice is coming, huh? You'll run with it, paint that broad brush. Okay? Now, it's true on the other side, too. Anderson Cooper, the other day, he interviewed this guy. Uh, he introduced him as left-wing activist John Sullivan. He's the founder of Insurgents USA, which he founded after George Floyd, which is a very violent Instagram page, which is shut down now. Um, surely the CNN producers saw his Instagram page. And he was at that riot, and he was, he was telling Anderson Cooper about all the awful things that were happening there. Well, the FBI arrested <laughs> John Sullivan. They have a video of him that he took he, from his YouTube. And I mean, I got the FBI report here, but it's just some of the, and this is from the video. We have video of it. Uh, we're about to burn this blank down. He started a chant, it's time for a revolution. Let's go, this blank is ours, blank yeah, we accomplished this blank, we did this together. Let's burn this blank down, we're a part of history. Uh, there's a video of him climbing a wall and then helping other people up it, and he says, uh, you guys are blanking savage, let's go. And then he got inside, we're gonna get this blank burned, it's our house, blank. We're gonna get this blank. And then he encountered law enforcement officers. He was in a narrow hallway and there was some law enforcement there. And he told him, listen, you guys gotta stand down. He said, there's a ton of people, like a fellow rioters here. There's a ton of people behind us and I don't want you to get hurt, man, you gotta stand down. And then he and others broke a window and they were goading a woman. Ashley Babbitt to climb up and they helped her climb up through the window. And that's the woman who got shot and killed by that police officer who was on the other side of that door. He was a part of that. Um, it goes on. More, more of that. Right? And Anderson Cooper talking to him as if he's a journalist. As if he's some, some journalist there who was, uh, it's terrible what happened, isn't it? He's been charged with a lot of crimes. Now, oh, and he's like an Antifa guy. I should say that, that's the point, sorry. He's an Antifa guy. He's a big Black Lives Matter Antifa guy. He was arrested this summer for, uh, not Antifa, sorry, he's a big Black Lives Matter guy. So those are a little bit different. He was a big Black Lives Matter guy. He was uh, arrested this summer for black, rioting for Black Lives Matter. Now, that fits into the narrative if you're on the, on the further right and you want to think that this was all Black Lives Matter Antifa people. Oh, here, there it is. There's the guy. The, the proof. This was an Antifa. It's, that's one. All right, so here's what I've done here on this show, show so far. I've documented the story of two people. Two. And if you want it to be an uh, insurrection, there you got your guy. If you want it to be an Antifa uh, a, a trick to go, boom, I got your guy. And you can make it up whatever you want from there. But there were a lot of people there. So what happened at the Capitol? It's whatever you want. Also, this picture of the old woman at the, uh, the Capitol with the American flag, right? She wasn't there. She was in Topeka. That's just an old picture. And people started sharing it around, posting it like as if she was at the, the riot. <laughs> she, was, she was in Topeka. Everything's all made up. It's all made up. That's why social media specifically, which we'll get to in the next segment, but our modern world in general, it's so difficult to make sense of because there's so many different versions of everything and our brains can't handle it. Right? Our brains, we're so bombarded with information. Our brains can't process it, so we put everything into a box. Right? We have a primal desire to do this, to put everything into a box. And it's good that we do it, right? Our brains wouldn't be able to function otherwise. We wouldn't be able to make sense of the world, all right? You can't walk through the world with constant nuance all the time. There's too many unknowns that would be paralyzing. So if you're walking in a dark alleyway, you paint a broad brush, you put it in a box. Is this safe? Probably not, right? Could be safe, maybe it's not, but you put it in the box if it's not safe. You do it with people. This person looks dangerous, is he? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But we have these primal sensors that are usually very good things to have. But in our modern world, we're so bombarded with information all the time, our brains are just in constant overdrive trying to make sense of things, right? Like back in the day, you weren't bombarded. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't have just like constant things coming at you nonstop. 
So your brain didn't have to work that hard. You woke up and you worked on the farm, and you, right? But now you're bombarded with the news of not just your family and your, even your community, but with the world. So our brain is just constantly like, where do I put everything? And we tend to put everything then into these, cat, into these boxes that agree with our worldview. Does that make sense? So you're wondering right now, you're saying, all right, Slater, I get it, fine, sure. But what happened at the Capitol? <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's the point. That's an unanswerable question. I can tell you two stories. I can tell you that weirdo shaman guy with the horns. I can tell you what he did at the Capitol. And I can tell you about John Sullivan, the Black Lives Matter rioter, an activist. I can tell you what, I can tell you his story. But you can't say, you can't say what happened at the Capitol. It's un, it's, there's too many. As a grand narrative, it's impossible. And that doesn't feel good. Like this segment right now, like I told, like this is usually the time of the segment where I make like a, like a grand conclusion, like a sweeping statement of truth. <laughs> All right, and it feels good. You're like, oh, that was good. That was like a 10 minute segment, told a story, and then, uh, whew, all right, good, good conclusion. There's no conclusion to this segment. And that uneasy feeling you have, you're like, oh, well, I don't know what I, like, so what did happen? Uh, uh, that's my point. See how that doesn't feel good, that I didn't answer the question of what happened at the Capitol? That's your brain wanting to put it somewhere. That's proof, that uneasy feeling you have right now is proof of how powerful our desire is to put everything into a box. We want everything to be so neat and tidy. But not everything is neat and tidy. And we just don't like that. Here's my third example from the weekend. Uh, this is the CNN chief national security correspondent. Uh, listen, look at this tweet. Fake credentials. Loaded gun. 500 rounds of ammunition. Oh man, our minds are going crazy with a narrative that someone is gonna sneak in and kill Biden. Uh, Wolf Blitzer, he tweeted, uh, there's, a very dis there's very disturbing breaking news here in Washington, and then went on and said basically that exact same thing. He's even telling you what to think. This is disturbing. Just so you know what box to put it in. Oh, this is disturbing. Well, like always, the truth came out <laughs> eventually. Yeah, you know, you know, 10,000 retweets later. And it wasn't fake credentials. It was a different law enforcement guy. He had unauthorized credentials, but he had it was for a different area, right? So it's just bad communication bet between tons of different, uh, different types of law enforcement. Um, and he was completely cleared, <laughs> and, and there's no more further investigation. That, that was the story. So even this weekend, with that instance, what happened? It's whatever you want. Was it an insane lunatic with fake credentials who was trying to gonna fire off 500 rounds? If, sure. If you want to believe that, then that's what you got. And really, because the left owns the media, it's whatever they want. Coming up next, I want to give my full presentation as to why uh, we're leaving big tech and uh, moving over to mikeslater.locals.com. We'll do that next, spread the word. Hey, Cider Crusaders, I wanna give my uh, presentation here as to why I personally am leaving big Tech, and I'm moving everything over to mikeslater.locals.com and why I want to encourage you to make direct connections with people who create inputs that make you the person you want to be. Make a direct connection with people who create inputs that make you more the person you want to be. So four reasons why I'm leaving uh, Big Tech. First, uh, well, they addict you, they outrage you, they bombard you and they algorithm you. We all know how addicting the social socials are designed to be. They are not designed to inform you, they're designed to addict you. And I don't wanna be addicted to things at all. That means I have less self-control. Uh, second thing, they, how do they addict you? Well, they do it by outraging you. 
It's just constant outrage nonstop. Everything's a catastrophe all the time. It's the worst thing that's ever happened. When the Capitol, what happened at the Capitol was the worst day in American history. Of course, for, uh, except for, you know, the Civil War. Everything's outrage, and I'm tired. Uh, third thing, the bombardment. They bombard you. I can't take it anymore. You're not selectively reading news or opinion that can improve your life. You're just bombarded with fools. <laughs> Non-stop. And it's constant and it's soul crushing. You were never meant to take that on all day, every day, when you wake up first thing in the morning or in the middle of the night, before you go to bed. It's just a bombardment. And then the algorithm. Why do I let some algorithm that was written by some guy in Silicon Valley who has a worldview that is antithetical to mine, write an algorithm that determines what inputs I have in my day. The other day, uh, I was on Twitter and I got this tweet from Arthur Chu. Arthur Chu's a Jeopardy champion, but he's crazy far on the left. And he wrote this horrible thing about uh, Ashley Babbitt, about how she's a piece of, of meat that merely moves like a human and you should feel as bad for her dying at the Capitol uh, as you, you would when they, uh, if they put down a rabid animal and all this like horrible dehumanizing stuff. Why did this show up on my Twitter feed? I don't follow Arthur Chu. He's only got 50,000 followers, so it's not like he's like this massive cultural force that can't be ignored. So why did the Silicon Valley algorithm say, you know what Slater needs right now? You know what Slater needs? Slater needs a little horrific, soulless dehumanizing just sprinkled on top of his day. That'll be really good for him. Come on. The algorithm is designed to appeal to the worst of us, and it incentivizes terrible behavior. And I feel it in me, too, not only as a um, recipient of it, but also as a creator. Uh, it's the loudest, the craziest, the most insane. For women, it's the most scantily clad. Those are the things that are always shared the most. And I don't want anything to do with that algorithm. I'm taking control. <laughs> the ultimate scripture for this, and there, there's many to share, but the ultimate scripture is Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. True, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. <laughs> the algorithm is none of those things. The algorithm doesn't care about that. And the person who wrote it has never read Philippians 4.8. Romans 12.2, do not be conformed to this world. Uh, the word, word for world is aegeon, or aeon, uh, which means age. So it's like this moment in time. Do not be controlled by this moment in time, which is controlled by big tech. Don't be conformed by it, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, right? What is good and acceptable and perfect before God, the will of God. Psalm 101.3, I will set no worthless things before my eyes. No worthless things. The Hebrew word baliael, for worthless. It's used 27 times in the Old Testament. Uh, it's used to describe a, a range between worthless and wicked. Right? Things between worthless and wicked. Uh, just ignore those things, it says. It's just meaningless nonsense. Isn't that most of social media? Proverbs 16, 28, a perverse person stirs up conflict. What is social media, if not conflict and <laughs> just perversion? So the point is, when you're in the social media companies, when you're in their world, you are in an algorithm determined by people in Silicon Valley who have a worldview that is completely antithetical to yours, who are constantly pumping content that ranges between worthless and wicked into your brain. And we quoted Heinrich Hein the other day, 1836, he wrote a poem, and uh, one of the lines was, thought precedes action as lightning precedes thunder. Your inputs determine your thoughts. Your thoughts determine your actions. Your actions determine your identity. So we gotta go backwards. Who's the type of person I wanna be? That's my identity. What does that person do? What are the things that that person does? Okay, people who do, do those types of things, what are their thoughts? What are they thinking about? Okay, to get those thoughts, what inputs do, inputs do I need to have in my day every day? Inputs, thoughts, action, identity. And now work backwards. 
We need to be thinking about things that are true, noble, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Where do we get those inputs? So I've decided to move over to mikeslater.locals.com because we still want to connect, right? And we still want to exchange ideas and all that stuff. So and there's going to be a lot more answers popping up here and there. Uh, but I've chosen to go to mikeslater.locals.com. It's a Dave Rubin. He, he's the one behind this platform. Um, and I think it's really good. Um, I think we need to change our habits to support and connect directly with people who create inputs that will change our thoughts and our actions and our identity. No more algorithms. Direct connections. It's about curating our inputs, which is something we've been talking about for a year. All right? Curating our inputs and directly connecting with people whose inputs we want. That means subscribing to newsletters, going directly to websites, watching the first, signing up for the fourth watch newsletter from the first, which is fantastic. It's an amazing newsletter, truly. Uh, it's about being more selective, not letting Silicon Valley bombard you with whatever they want you to, to think about today. Apple News is one of the worst things ever. Do, like, you know, you're just scrolling on your phone, you just scroll left too far and all the Apple News is there. Don't let Apple News curate your inputs. So real quick, mikeslater.locals.com. We'll talk more about it as the week goes on. But first of all, I'm sick of providing content that makes people in Silicon Valley rich. That's stupid to do for me. Second, there's, there's a drive always on the internet to go viral, right? I gotta get likes and shares and comments, blah, blah. And the incentive is to do things that are really not good in order to get those shares. On Locals, I'm not interested in going viral or like captivating your attention. You won't believe what Nancy Pussy did. Share, comment, like, blah. Right? It's just, it's just us, right? It's just our community is the word they use. We're just keeping it local. Also, when you're on the socials, your attention span goes to zero. This goes to zero because you're always scrolling. So you're scrolling for the next hit, right? The next interesting thing. And you always think, oh, the next thing's gonna be more interesting. The next thing's gonna be more interesting. And you keep scrolling and pretty soon 48 minutes go by and you never really found anything interesting. When you go to mikeslater.locals.com, uh, I would love it if you had a different expectation, right? Because you're not bombarded, right? I want it, I want to have, Social media is very shallow thinking. I want to have deeper thinking over on mikeslater.locals.com. I think of it like a casino. If you, if you want to find someplace to read, no one goes to the casino. Right? No one's reading on the casino floor with the, it's like the slot machines. Like lights flashing, bells ringing, drunk people tripping over you, blowing smoke in your face. Like no one reads a book that way. No, no one's like, oh, I can't wait to, I got an hour this weekend, I'm going to read. Um, my favorite little spot is right between uh, Blackjack and the slot machines. It's just my favorite little... <laughs> MikeSlater.com, MikeSlater.locals.com, it's a quiet place. Right? It's a quiet place. It's a, it's a quiet glade. I don't really know what a glade is, but you know, glade air freshener, it's like a picture of like a calm place. So, right? Wherever your favorite reading nook is, a forest trail, whatever, your quiet place is, a cabin in the woods, that's MikeSlater.locals.com. And I think... I want to foster more of that type of environment in my life everywhere. <laughs> I need less stress in my life. So that's it. Enough. There's, and also there's no trolls because I'm in charge of whoever gets in. Uh, everyone's welcome. Every, every opinion is welcome as long as you have an argument that goes with it. And the other rule is we only assume the best of each other. More things we'll talk about later, but we got a lot more to do on today's show. So please join us at mikeslater.locals.com. Um, it looks different, so it's going to take some getting used to. Uh, but I, I want it to be a quiet place where we can think deeply about important things. MikeSlater.locals.com. Coming up, uh, our thoughts on Mar uh, this Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Next. Hey, Slider Crusaders, before we get to Professor Vincent Rack and Yellow and the latest on COVID, I want to give you a couple thoughts here on uh, this Martin Luther King Jr. Day, this Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And that's my first point, Reverend. <laughs> the Reverend is, I think, intentionally being left out of his name because many don't want to remind you that he was a reverend <laughs> and he preached the Bible. 
And the civil rights movement was a gospel-centered movement. So that's my first point, first and foremost. The civil rights movement was a gospel-centered movement. Second, the civil rights movement was a declaration of independence-inspired movement. This is a little bit of his um, I Have a Dream speech. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He goes on and says, it's obvious today that America's defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. So MLK's message was first, Excuse me, the reverend, see I fall for this too. The reverend's message was first based on the Bible, right? When he said, let my people go, <laughs> right? What is, it's Moses, Exodus 5.1. And you know, our founders viewed America as an exodus as well. This was Ben Franklin's proposed seal of the United States of America, right? Our founding fathers, they got together and they said, well, what's our seal of America gonna be? And this was Ben Franklin's submission that's, it's kind of hard to see. That's Moses parting the Red Sea. Exodus, right? The first pilgrims to America, of course, they thought they were, and they were, uh, leaving tyranny to freedom, right? They thought they were an exodus. From our, so our pilgrims thought that. Our founding fathers believed that. The reverend believed that. All of this Bible-centered. Or Bible-inspired. Uh, what would I say? Gospel, gospel-centered declaration inspired. Uh, today, the civil rights movements that are going on today are not only not gospel-centered, but antithetical to the Bible entirely. Right? They're not, like, they're against the Bible, and they're not hearkening back to the truth of our founding. They're attacking both of those things entirely. The civil rights leaders of today, the activists of today, they don't see the Declaration as a promissory note. They see the Declaration of Independence as, 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 as this racist document written by a bunch of evil slave owners. Who all and it all, everything they've ever done, including this nation <laughs> completely, needs to be thrown into the ash heap of history. The Reverend never thought that. So the original civil rights movement was gospel-centered. The current Black Lives Matter critical race theory movement is anti-gospel. The original civil rights movement was based on American principles, the truth of the Declaration of Independence, and living out the American promise to the fullest. The current Black Lives Matter critical race theory movement is about destroying that legacy and destroying those truths for everyone. Third point, the original civil rights movement was of course peaceful. And the current Black Lives Matter critical race theory movement is, is not. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, the Reverend, was inspired by Gandhi. As we all know, Gandhi and his nonviolence. But Gandhi was inspired by three people in particular. There was a leader in India, he was a, a Jain leader. Uh, in the late 1800s, and, and he called for nonviolence. Uh, his other inspiration was Tolstoy. Tolstoy, uh, who among other things, obviously, wrote a, something called A Letter to the Hindus. Right? So he wrote a letter to Hindus in India on how to fight back against British colonization. He's like, what is up with you people? There's very, like, there's not, I forget the numbers, but there's not a lot of people here in, in England. There's even fewer British people in India, and you're a country of hundreds of millions. <laughs> Why are you being colonized by the British? 
knock it off. He has this line, he said, this is Tolstoy, love is the only way to rescue humanity from all ills. And in it, you too have the only method of saving your people from enslavement. So it was a message of love that deeply inspired Gandhi, obviously. And then the third inspiration for Gandhi was John Rushkin, uh, another author, mid-late 1800s. Uh, he wrote a book called Unto This Last. And Gandhi read it. He was on a 24-hour uh, train ride, and someone gave him that book. He was in South Africa. And he read it straight, and he said, uh, this book instantaneously changed my life forever. And maybe one day we can spend more time on it. But uh, my point of bringing this up is Gandhi had three main influences. In this is what he said. Right? He said, these are the three main influences in my life. Two of them were Christian. So you had the Bible influencing clearly these two Christian men, John Rushkin and Leo Tolstoy, who then influenced Gandhi, who then influenced the Reverend. And should <laughs> influence us today as well. But of course, our nation is instead, I should say the activists instead. Well, no, no, our nation is following the activists of Black Lives Matter and the critical race theorists which is antithetical to all of this and actively seeks to burn it all down, in fact. So on this Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Day, let's get back to these first principles. Let's get back to what we know works. This, this is like, these are like the basics, right? When, when uh, every sports movie ever, whenever the team loses, think of like every Mighty Ducks movie or whatever, the team loses to a team they shouldn't lose to, right? And what does is, what is Gordon Bombay do? Right? The next day, or even that night, they go back to basics. They run the drills. Right? And that's what we got to do in this country. Right? We got to get back to the basics and just run through the drills. We need movements and just a nation that is gospel centered, declaration of independence uh, uh, focused, and then, of course, nonviolent. And I'd argue today we're doing the opposite of all of these. Professor Vincent Racaniello, coming up next, we'll get the latest on, on more strains. Why isn't the vaccine being <laughs> rolled out way more than it is right now? And we'll talk about um, some more reports of, of really bad side effects coming from the vaccines as well. It's all coming up. Spread the word. Hey, Saturday Crusaders, want to go right to Professor Vincent Racaniello. Of course, he's the professor of virology at Columbia University and uh, host of uh, This Week in Virology, Microbe.tv. Please get all of your COVID news from there. <laughs> uh, we'll get it here, the short version here, and then go to Microbe.tv and, and watch the, the, the fullness of it there. Uh, professor and I were just talking before we got on about this uh, story out of Norway. Uh, 23 people have died in Norway after receiving the vaccine, and uh, they, they may stop it, or they are stopping it, or something like that. And that's the media. That's why I say I don't trust the media with anything, uh, but even these stories, because that's not the full story. Professor, what's your first thought when you hear that 23 people died in Norway from the vaccine? So without even looking at the information, my first thought is it has nothing to do with the vaccine, and that's usually what happens, is that when you immunize millions and millions of people, things happen. People die for various reasons. And in this case in Norway, they were immunizing very uh, old individuals in nursing homes with a lot of other morbidity, comorbidities or other diseases, as we say. And a number of them happened to die and they've concluded it had nothing to do with the vaccine. This is the Pfizer vaccine, which is being rolled out in many other countries. We don't see similar issues. So you have to really be careful when you see a headline because I know a lot of people get scared by it. They're worried about this vaccine. But there's always something better if you just dig down a little bit beneath it. Um, so how could one conclude that it didn't come from the vaccine? And maybe not even the vaccine, but like the... the right, so, so the, the claim must be that they were going to die that day anyway? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for example, if, <laughs> when they were doing the... <laughs> when they were doing the... Uh, the, the uh, clinical trials of the vaccine. They had a vaccine group and a placebo group. And, and you know, they put it in 30,000 people. And after it was over, they report the adverse events. And sometimes you see deaths, right? 
and you see deaths in the placebo group and in the vaccine group because people die when you take 30, 40,000 people and follow them for a few months. Some of them are going to die, heart attacks, car accidents and so forth. And you just look at the distribution of these cases between vaccine and placebo group. We talked about this last week with the Bell's palsy story. You asked me why are these people getting Bell's palsy and it happens in the placebo group as well. And this is hard uh -huh. to get uh, wrap your head around. I, I totally get this, that this idea that that person was gonna die at that minute, it just happens. And uh, you know, kids get vaccines, things happen to them. It's really hard to convince the parents that it wasn't the vaccine. So it's mm -hmm. a tough, it's a tough mountain to climb, but I, I think, yeah, uh, how can you tell? You said, how can you tell it's not the vaccine? Well, you look at their underlying morbidities and maybe they've been very sick lately and have other symptoms. They just happen to get the vaccine and uh, then they die. But you, you, what you said is yeah. correct. They were gonna die anyway that day. Wow, it's hard to convince, right? Cause that's an, that's an acute moment to point to, right? Like yeah. everything was going normal and then a thing happened and then they died. It's like, well, clearly the thing, right? Now, yeah. is there a claim? I heard something that like, uh, the, the um, adverse effects are 85 times more than the flu, or uh, happened more often, I think was the claim. Whatever the number is, um, what do you know about the reaction? I think I used your word on, on uh, your podcast, reactogenicity. Reactogenicity, right. is that the right term? <laughs> ah, very good. Yes. Uh, is there more reactogenicity to this vaccine than other vaccines? Well, it's hard to know so far because we've only done, what is it, uh, 13 million people here. And, uh, you know, for flu vaccines, we typically do more. But as Daniel Griffin said, the first shot, the typical adverse effects are pain at the injection site. Uh, and then uh, a second shot, you typically get more reactogenicity because now your body has seen this antigen before, this protein before, as foreign and it's going, ah, I remember this, and it's reacting even more vigorously. And Daniel Griffin said seven days after their shot, people get this rash at the site of injection. It's very typical. A physician who got their vaccine just emailed me a picture of her arm this morning with that. So it seemed to be slightly different reactions than we see in a flu vaccine. I've not seen that reported, but they're all very mild. You know, They're not life-threatening, and that's the key here. It doesn't really matter if you're getting a lot of different reactions. Um, a, an un, I was talking to some friends yesterday who are in the uh, military, and they've, they've all gotten the vaccine, uh, mm -hmm. except for the ones who have uh, a pregnant wife, or I should say their pregnant wives did not get the vaccine. That seems to me to be a group that I would have the most pause on, right? I mean, that's... Is there, do you see any reason why, scientifically, this vaccine could have any effect on a fetus in any way? So the, the one of, there are two issues here. First is that the uh, trials have not included pregnant women, right? And so you can't use a vaccine in a population in which it hasn't been tested. And you know, pregnancy is a difficult time because there are many changes in the body. And one of them, which is very important, is that pregnant women ha are immunosuppressed. Their immune systems are dampened down a bit, so they have different responses to infectious diseases. They have different responses to vaccines. Now the mRNA vaccines are just making a foreign protein. There's not actually an infectious virus there, but we, we want to be careful, right? And so we can protect them until we find out if the vaccine is safe in them. And that's why right now we are not immunizing them, but you're absolutely right. That's a population you would like to immunize at some point. And I'm sure we will. Oh yeah, and how do you test that, right? That's a, that's a tricky one to get people to sign up to that, I imagine. Um, yeah. Coronavac. Uh, what is Coronavac? You said, you know, obviously the, the two vaccines we have now are not the actual disease. Is Coronavac? So Coronavac is made by a Chinese uh, biopharm company. And what they did is they, they grew huge amounts of the virus in cells in a, in a production facility, you know, many, many hundreds of liters. They purify the virus and then they treat it with a chemical to knock out its infectivity. So the virus now can no longer infect you uh, and then it's injected into your arm. It's kind of like uh, Jonas Salk's polio vaccine, right? The first polio vaccine released in 1955. They grew up lots of polio, inactivated it chemically, and then that's what we get in our arms. So this is a bit, this is very different from the mRNA vaccines, of course, because it's the virus particle, right? 
it's just inactivated. And, you know, the results aren't great. We talked about those on the last TWIV, uh, but it's, be- it's better than nothing. Right now, we don't have enough vaccines for everyone. So, you know, whatever the protection is, uh, 50-some percent, which is borderline good, they're going with it. When do you think that could come to America? I I would be suspicious of it coming to America. The FDA has to approve the data, and that vaccine has not been tested in the U.S. It's been tested in Brazil. Uh, it's been tested in Turkey and, and one other country that escapes me, but it's not in the U.S. So uh, I would be surprised if the FDA approved it, not being tested in U.S. populations. Now, this is a pandemic and anything goes, but I think in a couple of weeks, we're going to hear the results of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine the phase three trial, and that'll probably get an EUA. And so that'll fill in more gaps in our immunization programs. Uh, Does the FDA have to have a trial in America? It usually prefers to have uh, trials in the American population, because as you know, every population in different countries are different slightly. So they're genetically different. They can respond to vaccines and drugs differently. So the FDA does like to have data from US. Of course, that's in times when we have plenty of time to test things. Right now we're in a hurry, so they may decide uh, to forego that. Yeah, I wonder if we were in a different world where we had no vaccines in America and the only vaccine was this one that you said out of China, if they would maybe make an exception for that. But good news that that's not the the thing. So what's this Johnson & Johnson vaccine? How's this one work? So the Johnson & Johnson is similar to the uh, AstraZeneca. It's an adenovirus uh, which is containing the gene for the spike protein of, of SARS-CoV-2. It doesn't replicate. It just infects you. It's injected into the arm. It infects you, and it makes the spike protein, basically, similar to the mRNA, except it's now being delivered by a virus. And this one, they are claiming, would be a one-dose deal, right? So mm. if that's the case, that would be great, right? Because the logistics of two doses... Uh, is are turning out to be very difficult. So uh, I think uh, by the end of this month, which is very soon, we're going to hear about the phase three. And if those are licensed, that'd be great. I think that would be a, a really good. I, yeah. As you were talking about this, I was like, oh, bummer for the Johnson & Johnson people that, because how can you get better than the two vaccines we currently have, right? With like a 95% success rate or whatever. But that seems to be the weakness is that you can just do it with one dose. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's so how we'll it would see. be much, much we'll better. See. Yeah. How many vaccines do you think we'll ultimately have? Like, let's give this another year. How many vaccines are going to be on the market? Oh, in a year in the U.S. So we, we have Johnson & Johnson, and then we have Novavax, which uh, is, has started its phase three a couple of weeks ago. That's different. That's actually purified spike protein. So it's not a nucleic acid vaccine. It's just purified spike protein with an adjuvant. And uh, I think that will probably get licensed within two or three months, EUA at least. So that gives us one, two, J&J is three, and Novavax is four. And I don't know about AstraZeneca, what's going on with them, but uh, Daniel Griffin says they're having problems with the FDA. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that'll be licensed. So those four, but I I think um, there are a couple of others down the line that would get licensed. I would say we'd have a half a dozen vaccines within a year for sure. That's yeah. unbelievable. And all yeah. a little bit different uh, in different ways, or, yeah. or a lot of it different. Um, what do you know about the rollout? We have a graphic here of, of how many uh, vaccines have been distributed. Something like 30 something million. Only uh, you see that 13 million have been actually given to people, put ar- shots in arms. Uh, we did a yeah. story the other day of um, Israel. They set up a giant tent, and at the end of the day, um, there was no more people. And they had extra shots, so instead of throwing it away, they went outside and, and found a pizza guy, a pizza delivery guy, and they said, hey, you want a shot? And they, boom, put it in his arm, and that was it. Um, I love it. What do you know about it. why there's been a slow vaccine here, or sl- slow distribution, slow rollout? See, right, so there, there are a number of problems. So first of all, that it's up to the states. The states each get a batch of vac- vaccine based on how many people are in their state, and then they say, they're said, you take care of it. And some states have good distribution systems and others don't. And so that's why a lot of the vaccine sits in a freezer. And then of course we have this prioritization of who gets vaccinated, right? You know, you have the healthcare workers, they have older people with comorbidities and so forth. And that's fine. But the Israel approach is, hey, if we have vaccine left at the end of the day, let's just put it in somebody's arm. 
And, you know, we have some some governors. Uh, I won't name the one in my state, but, you know, he says, I'm going to find you a million dollars if you give the vaccine to the wrong person. And I, yeah, it's the wrong approach. Just give it to people. Protect as many people as you can. And don't get so hung up on, you know, whatever your 1A, 1B, 1C ranking is. So I, I think logistics and also this problem, you know, you should give it to older people. What, what if they can't make it that day? Then you end up with vaccine in your future. Give it to someone else and hit them another time. So I think we need, we need to be more flexible. There. That's my take. My governor uh, did that and said, I will smear your name. I will, I will shame you publicly. Uh, if you go out of line as well. So he threw fine and, and then public shaming too. Um, I, I heard the analogy, I don't know if you agree with it, that you want to rescue people from the fire, right? But you all, So that would be the older people. But you also want to put out the fire, yeah, which would be sure. just giving everybody else a shot too. I thought, I thought that was a good one. Um, I had one more question. Do, 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 do. Oh, I was going to ask you about encephalitis. Uh, maybe you could comment on that, and then uh, I'll give you uh, the final word here of anything else you think we need to know right now. What do you want to know about encephalitis, inflammation uh, of the brain? I, yeah, and, and if that's a possible side effect that you've seen or any connection. With the or vaccine? Of COVID. With, with, well, with COVID itself and any other big major side effects, uh, you know, long-term side effects of COVID. Yeah, so there certainly are brain effects in COVID, right? Neurological effects. And in a very small fraction of people, the virus seems to be getting in the brain. And the way it does that is in your nose, you have uh, receptors for smell, right? They're called olfactory receptors. And, and, the vir and those nerves go from the, your olfactory mucosa, that is the surface of your, of your nose, into your brain. They have a direct pipeline. And so the virus takes that and can get in the brain. And so there's some en encephalitis, Whoa. which means inflammation caused by an infectious agent but most of the brain symptoms are caused by immune responses. Uh, you know, when you make responses against infectious agents, the, the proteins that are main can get into the brain and they can have effects there as well. So that, that's really, it's not really a true encephalitis, but rather a, an effect of the, uh, the immune system. Rare or more, you know, pretty common? How would you put that? Well, the, the, the brain symptoms are not so rare. A lot of people end up having, you know, mental issues and confusion, cognitive issues, even motor issues as well. Not, not terribly rare. I, I don't know what the number is offhand, but a, a lot of people have it. And a lot of the long COVID patients have neurological symptoms as well. Wow, amazing. Uh, we have to run, Professor. Do you have any final, final words for us this week? And well, this is, the, this is the year we're going to conquer this for sure, right? This is the last year of the pandemic. These vaccines are coming out. I'm sure we're going to improve our distribution. They're going to work. And I, I would have faith that uh, we're going to have life back to normal maybe by the fall. Wow. No more mutant strains going to come out and throw a giant wrench in it and everything? I think if they do, uh, we'll be able to handle it. And uh, But, you know, you ought to keep having me on every now and then to talk about it. <laughs> we certainly will. You always have an open spot here, Professor. Um, Thank you. Uh, professor, and and, and uh, everyone needs to watch uh, Professor Vincent Reckon those podcasts as well. Uh, Microbe.tv. Thanks, Professor. We'll do it again on Monday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful day. That's our show. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word.